Hello and welcome to the Leaders' Council podcast, the podcast for the people who run the country and the people who keep the country running. You join us on yet another overcast day here in the capital. I'm Matthew O'Neill, and today, as always, we ensure that we have a variety of distinct perspectives on leadership. First, we're joined by Nick Hardy, founder of Hardy Signs, one of the most recognized and preferred signage suppliers in the United Kingdom. Nick, hello. Hi. Hi. Well, thank you for coming on the program today. Uh, We might as well dive straight in. What does the word leader mean to you? Okay. um, uh, A great leader is someone who can uh, understand his staff and also uh, lead the business uh, in in all uh, all shapes and forms. And how would you describe your personal leadership style? Okay. I like to think uh, I am an understanding boss. and whilst uh, sympathetic, I'm also uh, easily approachable, and uh, I, I try and do my best for, for my staff uh, and expect the best back from them. And of course, uh, one often forgets that the main part of being a leader, uh, especially in a business, is dealing with people, and people aren't always at their best. Sometimes they are fallible, and they get into uh, issues with each other, or they just don't perform uh, as you would wish. Um, how do you handle conflict within the workplace? Okay, yeah, conflict is obviously um, quite a big thing when you've got 25 staff um, and 25 different personalities. Uh, we, we're very quick to jump on any uh, problems and hopefully nip them in the bud before they start. But occasionally we do have things that we need to deal with um, a little bit more forcefully. So we, we obviously go down the path of um, employment law and, and keep everything legal on that that front whilst also being fair to the individual. Now, let's go back to the very beginning of your career when you first started out in business. Were there any particular individuals or uh, circumstances that really formed the way that you lead today? Yes. Um, my, my ex-boss, actually, uh, he sort of shaped my career in the early days. I, I, I did seven years at uh, traditional sign writers before I set up Hardy Signs. And the grounding he gave me uh, w- was second to none. And the support in the early years was, was invaluable to forming of the business. Now, how does traditional sign writing deviate uh, from uh, the practice which you engage in? Okay, it's a... It, Whilst the fundamentals are always the same, uh, a good sign is a good sign, however it's created. Uh, the early days, it was all handwritten signage uh, with a variety of paintbrushes, uh, lots of paint, and uh, what, what we, what's called a mall stick, which many people wouldn't even know <laughs> existed these days. But today, um, yeah, we're, we're fitting fully interactive digital signage into some of our customers' premises, wow. which is uh, certainly a long way away from uh, a pot of paint and a paintbrush. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, of course, uh, there are new people entering the workforce every day. Uh, what advice would you have to youngsters just entering the workforce? Okay. Um, the main qualification for me uh, is honesty. Uh, mm-hmm. Everything else can be taught with reason. But if, if you give me honesty as a as a young learner, uh, we can work with that and certainly guide you towards a, a rewarding career in, in our industry. Now, if I was to ask you to objectively identify the greatest leader, living or dead, who would that be? <laughs> Good question. Uh, on the spot, I'd have to go with Winston Churchill. Right. And what is it about Churchill's leadership style that um, directly appeals to you? I think um, under extreme pressure, he he was brave enough to make uh, massive decisions, which uh, ultimately shaped this country. Do you feel that lessons learned from Churchill can be used in the world of business? Yes, yeah, certainly. Certainly, I, I think you, you've got to make decisions at times that, that aren't popular. Uh, for the good of the company and for the good of the other employees. 
Now, of course, uh, within uh, the world of work, there are many challenges, uh, one of which uh, at the moment is um, our transition from being members of the European Union. Now, as a business uh, that has in the past uh, received funding from the European Union, is that uh, going to be an issue going forward? Well, I'd like to think that that funding in the future will come from the UK government. I do think that money will come from somewhere to help business. I certainly hope so. Now, if you could speak to yourself a decade ago, what sort of leadership qualities would you tell yourself to embrace and which ones would you say leave behind? Okay. Uh, The workplace has definitely changed in the last 10 years. I think perhaps 10 years ago, we would be a little bit more sterner, a little bit less interactive with our staff. But uh, certainly, as time's moved on, there's no room for for companies that don't look after their staff, and certainly no room for any kind of, uh, I don't know, any kind of major conflict or, or bad feeling amongst uh, staff members to their managers or indeed to each other. And why has the workplace changed so? I think, on the whole, society has changed uh, that, you know, there's a lot more uh, political correctness now than, than there ever was. And I think, as, as I say, as a company, if you don't embrace the current situation, uh, you, I don't think you'll survive long term. Hmm. So what can be done to entice a productive but uh, uh, comprehensive workforce these days? Well, I think you've got to engage with them. You, you've You've got to take uh, an interest in the individual. I do make a point of uh, walking around our workshops most days and interacting with uh, particularly some of the younger staff. So I think that's important that they see that, it, that I do care uh, how their progress is going and, and in, indeed keep an eye on uh, how they are developing as a person, as an, an, an employee at Hardy Science. Now, unfortunately, our time together is drawing to its close. But what does the next 12 months have in store for Hardy Science? Okay. um, Of course, there's lots of uh, uncertainty uncertainty still with Brexit. But uh, last year, we recorded a record year, both turnover and profit. And realistically, if we could replicate that year, I would be more than happy. Well, Nick, it's been an absolute pleasure discussing leadership with you, and I very much hope that you come back on the program at some point in the near future. Nick, thank you. you. That was Nick Hardy, founder of Hardy Signs. And now, if you haven't heard it before, is Jonathan White's exclusive interview with Sir Jeff Hurst. Uh, We're now joined, uh, though, by former England footballer and still the only man to score a hat-trick in a World Cup final, Sir Jeff Hurst. Uh, Thank you very much for coming on today. uh, You're welcome. You're welcome. Good afternoon. Uh, and perhaps I should uh, start and get it over and done with. I know you must be bored with it and uh, you've probably been asked a thousand times. But when you got out for a duck playing for Essex, uh, Jeff, what was going through your head at the time? <laughs> well, of course, that's not one of the most asked questions I get. Oh, there, there are one or two people who are very familiar um, who, who do Google me and realise that I did uh, score nothing for Essex. Uh, for my only game for Essex, first team when we played against Lancashire in Liverpool, a place called uh, uh, Egbert in, in, uh, in Liverpool, many, many years ago, 1962, I think that was. So I didn't, um, yes, I, I didn't really feel it at the time. It was lucky to be playing, I guess, there were one or two injuries. Um, but the problem that I had was, was really messing about between the two sports. That was very detrimental to me uh, over that period of time, mm. being stuck between the two sports. And I think uh, for those that uh, don't know, there's a there's a, another world that might exist where um, Sir Jeff Hurst was a, a first class cricketer and not perhaps a, a footballer. But um, whether it's business or cricket or or football, obviously the importance of leadership it can't be understated, no matter what form that comes in. When you were at West Ham, uh, Jeff, and when um, Ron Greenwood first uh, uh, came along, he made obviously some pretty radical changes. Was this a man that genuinely inspired confidence uh, the first time you'd meet him? Absolutely. I mean, he, he was simply a, a fantastic uh, coach or teacher, if you like, at football. 
And uh, they quite always mention when we talk about Ron Greenwood, Harry Redknapp, who was played under him and has been very successful as a player and, and the manager over many, many, many years. He and um, he's come across many coaches, of course, and managers during his time over the years. I guess he would still say that Ron Greenwood is the best coach he had worked with. He worked with. So you're very fortunate. I think you, you, you think you're lucky when you come across if you have a great teacher at school and uh, a great coach as we had in Ron Greenwood and, of course, a great manager in Sir Alf Ramsey. So to come across people like that of that calibre can have a huge influence on your your career, of course, and, and then your life. And that's, that's quite purely the case. Absolutely. And in those early days um, at West Ham, uh, with, with a manager like, like uh, Ron uh, there... It's also important to have uh, uh, confidence with your other players. And, of course, they become your friends. Who did you look at to at the time uh, when to inspire confidence in yourself? Was it more? Was it Peters? I think probably, well, I was very fortunate to play with the caliber of the players I did. Again, mm-hmm. again, extremely fortunate to play with you know, the captain um, of England and West Ham and Martin Peters who was a fantastic player. And some, as far as Martin's concerned, I think sometimes he didn't quite get the uh, recognition he deserved. And what a wonderful player he was. In terms of inspiring confidence, I always probably say that the biggest influence uh, for me, I guess, would be the captain, Bob Noor. Although he was only uh, about eight months older than me, he graduated through the system probably three or four years earlier. He played for England in 62, four years before the final when I played. And so he, he was more looked upon him more as a senior player, if you like, not as a, a guy in the same age group as me. And I looked at how he, how he uh, trained, how he acted, how he behaved and how he played. And so he, he would say, I would also say he was a big influence on me. One thing I would say about leadership, uh, what I do, I do understand clearly all walks of life. Leadership is at the top. is absolutely vital. For a, a for a business, a football team, in any walk of life to be successful, and it's quite evident. I was in the motor trade for a long time as well, selling car warranties to car dealerships, and you could almost tell when you walked into the business uh, in a, many of the car dealerships. You could almost tell from the moment you walked in by initial reaction, people came and welcomed you that the business was well run, or conversely, not well run at all. And so I understand the, the, the value and quality of leadership. And that's why I'm very fortunate to be involved with my career in those early days with two, two great leaders in, in Ron Greenwood and, and Alf Ramsey. Absolutely. And um, since you've already uh, brought him up, uh, Jeff, I think it'd be remiss not to go a little bit further with that. But obviously, uh, after uh, oh, at West Ham, your uh, plan came to the attention of uh, South Ramsey. Now, there's a man I'm sure when you walked into a room, you knew who was um, in charge. When it came to managing that England team, what was his style like, Jeff? Well, one thing, the first thing I say about Alf Ramsey, he's probably over my life the most powerful influence who had on me um, as a person. Um, mm. Naturally, it happens to an extent because he's got your whole career in his hand, whether he picks you for England or he doesn't pick you. It can have a great impact on your, <laughs> your career and, of course, your life. But yep. he, in that era, I was involved for six or seven years. He, it was quite clear who was the boss. He was quite very, very strict. Probably at a time, it may be overly strict, but at a time you probably wouldn't get necessarily get away with it in, in today's football because it's changed dramatically in how you deal with with players then and players now. But he was the most powerful man I came across, and very few people. And he, he was quite ruthless in getting people out who didn't want to be who didn't want to be part of a group, part of a team. It is important that if you've got a group of people, and that's in any walk of life, they're all singing off the same hymn sheet, and you don't have anybody that's griping or moaning about the system. And if you've got people like that in your organisation, one thing I have learned, and I've taken it on in my life, my family, if you've got somebody in a group that doesn't want to be part of it, you you get them out. And Alf, I think, was was quite ruthless with that in his, in his staff. And I think that's one, thing I, one of the most serious things I think I've learnt over a long period of time. And is there, do you think, uh, 
a, a specific moment? I'm sure there's probably dozens, but is there a specific moment, if you could uh, perhaps pick right now, that did show those uh, qualities in uh, Sir Alf so uh, sharply? Yes, I think for, for me, certainly, um, I think there are instances of players who you thought would, would be in the team or certainly in the squad, and surprising there were not. There was no necessary reason for it. But looking mm. back, I do think perhaps they were people that Alf didn't think wanted to be part of the group. Um, so that that's that for me. In terms of my personal view, I think that it looked prior to the um, World Cup that I was going to be playing um, in it, only a few games before I was I was playing and I played with Jimmy Greaves in the game against Yugoslavia only a couple of months before the final. And it looked at that stage as if I was going to be, be playing in, in the team. But uh, in a couple of friendly games, more friendly games, before the final in Poland and uh, uh, Norway, I think, and Denmark, mm. I didn't. I played two of the four games. And I probably didn't quite replicate my, my form that I'd been showing at West Ham and in the early couple of games for England. And he, he left me out in the first game of, of the World Cup against uh, Uruguay, he started off with Jimmy Green and Roger Allen. So I, I had an impact of thinking I, at that stage I like I was going to play and didn't start because of just a lack of form. I didn't play quite well enough to justify my position. And somewhat fortuitously, I only got back in the team because of a, a nasty gash to shin um, on Jimmy Green's leg. And I think what you've said there, uh, Jeff, actually does sum that up really well. And more than that, whilst it's important to have that someone in charge with those qualities, it's almost useless if there isn't a strong and unified team behind them. And there really must have been moments, Jeff, maybe there weren't, but uh, let us know in that 66 competition, the prolonged pressure on all of you, you know, the weight of a nation, did it get to you? Oh, not for me personally, no. I, I think, and I don't, uh, not for me, not for a second. I think mm. I was just happy to be, you know, be involved in the squad initially. Uh, not at all. I didn't, you're not aware of the magnitude of the occasion, really, looking back out. Mm. Uh, so I never really felt, people talk about pressure a lot and it's there and people, players talk about it, people talk about it in life. I didn't really feel necessary to feel any great pressure, pressure during the time I was there. And what is also important, to say about Alf Ramsey, the people he, he left behind that, that were left in the squad after he moved one or two players out, the squad were uh, a, a bunch of very hard-nosed, professional, uh, top-quality people. And that was, again, the leadership that Alf showed. He, he got people in together that were very, very strong personally. Um, uh, and I think that was part of the success we had. We were a very... I always describe our, our group as hard-nosed professionals. Um, we have some great players, but overall, they were great hard-nosed professional players um, and great quality people who we've kept in contact with, you know, over the years. And Jeff, I've got to ask, and I'm, I'm not making this up, I've genuinely heard that people do ask you whether or not you realise there were people on the pitch at that moment. I imagine you were busy on something else. Well, I... I did some theatre shows last year. They've gone fairly well, and we're going to do a series of uh, theatre shows. In fact, starting this week, over the next uh, two or three months. And uh, at the end of the theatre shows, we have about twenty minutes where we uh, uh, allow the people in the audience to ask questions. And the, the, there's, I won't mention both. But they're too long to talk about both questions. Um, one, the other one's a really stupid one. It's too long for me to tell you. It's absolutely ridiculous. Yeah. But the, the the other ridiculous question I get asked, did I realise there were people on the pitch? And of course I jokingly say, yes, I was just about to, to shoot to score the goal and I looked round, put my foot on the ball and looked round for a little while and said, oh dear, there are six or seven people running on the pitch. So that's, uh, I've had been asked that once at one of the theatre shows. <laughs> so I joke, make a joke about that and saying, yes, I put my foot on the ball and waited but just had a, look, had a glance round, you know. Maybe it does prove there are things that, such as stupid questions, really. Um, oh, yeah, there are. There certainly are. I've got another one which I won't bore you to. It won't be too long to tell you. 
Uh, I was in a jersey or Channel Lines jersey or jersey two or three mm. years ago in most stu- stupid, irrelevant questions that absolutely nothing to do with football whatsoever, which uh, was absolutely... But I can use that now because it, it is quite funny. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe another time then. But we... Um, uh, well, you want me, I, I can tell you if you want. You've want, you got time. I can tell, I tell you if you want. Jeff, go on. Go on. I think I'd be, it would be silly if I said no at this point. Okay, so I was uh, doing a... a at a dinner in you know, Channel Lines, three or four hundred people, black tie dinner, uh, guest of honor. Mm-hmm. And this occasion, I was speaking for about 20 minutes, then allowing uh, questions from the audience at the end of the evening. And there was usual football questions. And then all of a sudden, I heard a, somebody at the back who, who asked a question. I didn't quite hear what he said. He didn't have the microphone with him. So I said, I didn't hear what he said. Can you please give mm-hmm. this chap the microphone so I can hear clearly what he said? So the chap had the mic and he said, when a turtle loses its shell, is it naked or is it homeless? Right. <laughs> what, what a question. What a question. Uh, well, I think that would be in, definitely in the stupid category, wouldn't it? So we had a laugh about that. Is, uh, well, uh, and we, you've got to have a patient of a saint, I think, sometimes to put up with <laughs> well, things no, like I that. Just, but again, I found it amusing. I just found it amusing. In fact, some of the audience found it highly amusing as well, so it did... Uh, um, and again, if you, put, if you can put up with my questions, you can probably put up with uh, anything. <laughs> um, but th- there would have become a point, though, um, Jeff. I think um, you, you were a young man when see, this happened. When you must have realised that people, teammates, began looking at you for leadership. Um, is that something that occurred to you, or did you just realise that by by quick one way or the other? people actually begin to look up for you for inspiration? Well, possibly. That's never really struck me until you've actually mentioned it now, quite frankly. That's a new, a new question. Mm. Does anybody look up to me? I'm sure perhaps uh, there are. There are people who pay you compliments of, of uh, fans of, of West Ham and uh, of Stoke and, of course, in, uh, England fans who... Um, I, I think probably... Yeah, it would be very immodest of me to to suggest I, I felt that somebody was looking to me for inspiration. Um, well, you, but, you don't but, have to, but I will. Uh, um, well, it, it's, uh, it's okay for a third party to do it. Uh, perhaps, um, perhaps that may have been the case over the years. Uh, people look at you, and um, uh, maybe uh, it has a, a helpful effect. Uh, but I do think you, you, how you behave and set examples on and off the pitch is people must realise that that's, that has an influence, how you react and behave mm. to, to situations on and off the field. Surely probably has an impact to younger players coming in into the team laterally. Um, yeah. And, and with that, looking at um, uh, football today, uh, is there anybody that you think particularly on the field or the sidelines that strikes you as someone with... Um, those qualities that you could identify in a in a natural leader. Um, well, a player, current players, you mean? Oh, players, managers, anybody that uh, you look to today, really. Well, I think some of the outstanding. I think the, the, the best example about a, a leader and at the moment is is, is uh, Klopp at Liverpool. Mm. He has been absolutely fantastic to uh, acquire the players and get them to. Their attitude is absolutely fantastic. They're great players, but there's more than just being good players in football. It's a good player with a fantastic attitude and their willingness to work for each other and the team is absolutely outstanding. Hence these unbelievable results. There are, you know, and the great players not always succeed as as individuals or probably even uh, certainly as a team if you haven't got the right attitude alongside it. And they're probably, and that that comes through the leadership. That's not just luck. That's absolutely. that's absolutely leadership. He'd be the best example, of course, in, in football terms today. Uh, easily, easily. And of course, but going back not that long ago, Alex Ferguson, who just absolutely, mm. you've got to take him as the first example. But Klopp's only done this over a period of time, a short period of time. But if you look at the 25, 26, 27 years that. Alex Ferguson did with Manchester United 
and subsequently since he's gone, how they they are not doing so well. It, it, he's the best example of management I've seen. We've seen we've probably ever seen, and I don't think anybody will see the light of that kind of leadership again. It's ast- absolutely astonishing, astonishing. And do you think? Could you imagine uh, Sir Alf or even Ron Greenwood managing teams today? Yes, I think so. I think yes, uh, no, mm. no question at all. I think they uh, Ron Greenwood. Yeah, well, the, the answer, straightforward answer, is yes. Um, That's a good they, answer. <laughs> the straightforward answer is yes. I can elaborate as much as you want, but the straight answer is absolutely categorically yes. Uh, and with um, and I know. Uh, if we could talk about this probably for the next hour or so, but um, I'm conscious of the um, time. Um, looking um, back uh, through your um, playing career, perhaps especially um, your time uh, for England, who was it uh, that struck you more than anyone else on the pitch uh, that displayed qualities of not just leadership, but uh, companionship and and level headedness that you think that have stuck with you all these years later. Well, I think we were, I was very fortunate, and I wouldn't take any one player out. I think looking at so that, many. yeah, so many, and that's why we were successful because we had so many um, showing all those qualities that you just mentioned uh, throughout the team. I think that that was outstanding, and uh, uh, and it's an opportunity to talk about. Uh, all of them in, in that breath, and there was nobody. And I'm going back from an earlier earlier question for me: the um, all hard nosed professionals, good good teammates, mm. good socially, and that's why we kept in touch with each other on our golf days every year uh, up until about five years ago. Of course, with, with the uh, sadly dwindling yes. numbers, we we still got on. Our wives got on with, all together all those years later. It didn't just finish. After '66, they, that reunion, that camaraderie, that team spirit, mm. the, um, uh, getting on with each other, lasted for, for a long, long, long time. And I wouldn't and, when it, when you put those those questions and how you categorise those, I would pick every one of the eleven players um, who you put in that category that were like that. There was nobody else; they were all outstanding, and I think that was. A big part. I can't stress how big Absolutely. a part that was, and I've said that many, many times for the success of the team. We have some great and players. You... We have some great players, of course, but without the attitude <laughs> alongside that, going back to an earlier question, you we wouldn't have been as uh, ultimately, ultimately as successful. Exactly. Without that, you, the, the the whole will never be greater than the sum of its parts. But with it, yes, the word, the word is showed... team. The word is t- the word is team. Absolutely. And I always use the word team when I talk sometimes. Uh, together, everyone achieves more, and that—that's the same in any walk of life. That, that's fundamental. And uh, lastly, uh, Jeff, looking—if if you were to uh, give advice, and whether this is in sport or business or indeed any other walk of life, what would you identify, if you can, as the key tenant uh, that you can't go without in terms of leading a team, no matter what that team is? Single minded. Uh, Single mindedness, dedication, dedication to the job. Um, thinking about that 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 role, that job in leadership all the time. It's a huge part of your life. But if you, I don't think you can switch off when you're in, in business at the top level or sport at the top level. You may, you know, have a, way, have a couple of weeks holiday. But I'm even sure if, if these top managers and lead, leaders in all walks of life are away on holiday on a beach. Somewhere warm, I'm sure there's not. Uh, there's, they will not switch off for for two weeks um, and completely uh, not think about their role as the boss of an organisation. And I think that's you're completely focused. You're always thinking about uh, things, thinking about improvements, and it's just dedication and uh, uh, tuning your life to being successful. Excellent. Well, Jeff, on that point, thank you very much for joining us today. You're welcome. Very good to nice to have a talk about this and just go over the go over the past and just uh, refresh my mem- my own memory about the quality of the players I grew up with. Excellent. Uh, another time, uh, it would be great to talk again. Thank, thank you, Jonathan. Thank you. This has been the Leaders Council podcast. 
Thank you for celebrating excellence in leadership with us. I have been your host, Matthew O'Neill. Until next time, goodbye. Thank you for listening to our podcast. The views expressed within the podcast do not reflect the views of the Leaders' Council of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, its parent company or subsidiaries, members of staff, other guests, or any other person therein associated.